We launched a, um, a huge effort to understand more about this species. Um, as was typical in that time, giant pandas were kept solitary um, until they were uh, in breeding season, breeding estrus or rut. And um, so we began an enormous behavioral as well as a reproductive study on pandas instead of being um, kept apart or socialized outside of the breeding season. So Ling Ling and Ching Ching began to be um, spent began to spend time together during the day. We also had uh, a project to renew their outdoor enclosures. We thought that if we provided some furnishings for the enclosure and give the pandas an opportunity to climb, it would case of these cubs to learn valuable information about immune, immune suppression, giving immunoglobulins to support the immune system, and just basic cub anatomy um, and physiology. Um, so Ling Ling's legacy um, is that she provides us with a wealth of knowledge about the basic foundation of female reproductive physiology. And we began our hormonal work. Um, we, um, we're, one of the first to identify this phenomenon of regular pseudo-pregnancies in female pandas. Um, we actually consider them obligate um, pseudo-pregnancy um, animals in that they always are pregnant, and it's just a matter of whether they conceive or not. For some reason, physiologically, they reverse pregnancy. And it could have to do with their low-energy diet. Um, it's really still quite an enigma, but they seem to always have a pseudo-pregnancy. It's just a matter of whether they have to be successful at mating. Um, Ling Ling died in um, 1992, leaving uh, Xing Xing alone for the next seven years. And the adaptations that pandas have for you know, the, the other is their enormous jaw and muscular structure. And I always think it's ironic that that big brown head that we find so cute are the jaw muscles that allow them to crush things. <laughs> Sometimes I like to remind people. <laughs> but, but those are enormous jaw muscles, and um, we're, we're, by the way, I think you all, being the pandophiles that you all know, that you are, know this, um, that we are genetically programmed to find big round heads, the ears that stick out, big eyes, I see the nuns, pudgy bodies that hold things. We're genetically programmed to melt when we see that. <laughs> and to have embodies all those characteristics, which are the characteristics of our children. So we did our first exam at day 25, and then he already weighed almost two pounds. He was 12 inches long. I have to say this was the most exciting nine minutes of my life. <laughs> first of all, we've been monitoring Mei Xiang in terms of when she was leaving him. And she first left him at about, I think it was five days, my memory's already fading, to just get a brief drink of water and go back. But when she started eating bamboo and leaving him for longer periods of time, we knew we could get in there and do a quick exam. Um, and so Dr. Sharon Dean, who was our veterinarian at the time, and our primary panda veterinarian, I called her up on the phone and said, Meisham was out of the den, we're going to close the door. She rushed right down from the zoo hospital and we did this quick nine minute exam. Um, toward the end of the exam, uh, Ty started to squeal and that got Meisham very anxious and up at the door looking for her cub. Uh, but we were able to get it back in and get them reunited without any problems. Um, and so that's the only data we got that day, besides his sex. And um, so we just had quick measurements and a quick veterinary exam. 